What's up, sports fans? Welcome to the Sports Opinions Podcast. This is episode number 12. I'm your host, as always, Alex Cuesta. You can find me on Twitter at AQuestaNBN, and of course, find Sports Opinions on Twitter at SportOpinion30. Sitting next to me, you know, we're doing this live for the first time. I'm having someone sit next to me and not over through the computer. Live next to me is the head coach at Marist College of cross country and track and field, Mr. Chuck Williams. What's up, Chuck? Hey, Alex. How's it going? Thank you for having me here. For all you Marist XCTF fans, follow us on Twitter at Marist XCTF or on Instagram at Marist XC. And what people don't know, I've talked a lot of times about how awful I was at track and field in college. And one of the reasons I was actually semi-decent early was the man sitting right next to me. Uh, he was my sprinting coach for my first two years where I was starting to turn around off an ankle injury, and then he abandoned me for the next two, and uh, the rest is history. So, But it, all in all, Chuck is a great, great coach. He's been a great asset to Marist College, and when I was actually coaching for a few years, he was one of the guys I looked up to and helped me out. So we're going to get right into talking about Marist College track and field, cross country. And for those of you that don't like cross country, track field, or Marist, I deal with care. it. Yeah, I don't care. Sit through it, you know, get through it. But one of the things we need to talk about is, Chuck, before you took over this program, the girls under Phil were, you know, they were a good program. They were a competitive program. But you have done something right now that's taken it to some pretty new heights. we just looking right now at the greats of the program just under you that you have had in both cross country and track. Chrissy McDevitt, Holly Burns, Brittany Burns, Catherine Sheehan, Addie DeFrancesco, Danielle Asaro, Michelle Gay, Kristen Traub, Nikki Nessie, Ashley Haynes. And those are just girls that, you know, had records or really, but you've had so many standouts what can you attribute all the success that you've seen in such a pretty short period of time as being a head coach? Well, as, as you said, Alex, I mean, when, when Phil, Co- Phil Kelly was the coach there, he did a remarkable job. The, the women won three MAC titles underneath him. He did a great job building the program. But the bottom line is the conference got better. The MAC conference has emerged to become one of the better conferences in our region. But I think the biggest thing that really I can say added to our success was when I took over for him, you know, I, I met with my mentor, Coach Pete Calazo, who has been at the program for... Who I will eventually have on. Pete, I know you barely listen to these. Sometimes you do, but I will have you on. You will come on, and we will talk about all the ridiculous stuff, probably not even some sports, because you like your politics a little and your music. We'll get into that. Yeah, I mean, Pete was my coach. We've been together for 23 years, but the biggest thing we talked about was recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. And our goal when we when I took over this program was to try to attract the best talent in the area to come to Marist College as a destination school for a program. And we knew it was going to take time to build up. Like Alex said, we had some great women come to us early on, and they really laid the groundwork for this team that we currently have. And the recruiting process is fun. It's, it's fun getting kids to campus and, and selling them on what you see as the vision for the program. And as Alex said, all of us being alums of the program itself, it's easy to, to speak about why we love Maris and why it's such a special place because, honestly, I haven't left since I was 18, so I must have found something right. And to all the women that I just mentioned, some of you are now married, and uh, that was your – You know, names before marriage. I don't know all of your names uh, post-marriage right now. I know Chuck does, (laughs) but I don't. So, you know, I was just going by your maiden name. And a lot of these girls, it's funny, a lot of these girls I ran with and were on the team with me. And then I ended up coaching a bunch of them. So I can really speak. I think only, like, out of all of them, only one I really don't know too well. I don't know Chrissy too well. But the rest of them, you know, I know pretty well. So I can speak a lot to what Chuck said. And they were a lot of pillars of um, what this program is now. And the biggest thing is, and the biggest thing I found with Chuck when I was an athlete of his is his philosophy, his enthusiasm. It's really easy to buy into. He's very enthusiastic. He's passionate, like he said, about Marist College, about the program, about where it's going to be. And the goal has definitely been to take this to new heights. And easily anyone could see from the outside looking in. This program is at heights it's never been to. We've had record season after record season and not just PRs dropping left and right and records coming off the record board, but the number of girls doing certain things has been insane. Over this past indoor season, what did we have? Three girls well under five minutes in the mile. And we're going to touch on all three of them, I believe, coming up soon because there is just so many on this current roster that's not only just contributors, but girls that would have been number ones 
in years past on the team. And right oh, now, they're, and right now, some of these girls are fighting to score in cross country. And it's just unbelievable. So how do you feel about, just in this short time, all the record seasons that you've been able to put together? I mean, obviously, you know, I'm very proud of all of our school records since I took over the program. Um, if you look at our school record board, and Pete and I talk about it a lot, especially in the women's side, but even on the sprint side, because before I took over the women's program, I was there coaching, as Alex said, the sprinters, the jumpers, and hurdlers from both the men and the women's teams, and I took a lot of pride in coaching them, and Alex is right. I helped him get to heights, and then he, like you said, I dropped him like a rock and started coaching the girls full-time, um, but it's, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun, but I mean, it's been amazing, but the corner we turned this year as a program has been remarkable. Uh, Alex said it. We this year we had our greatest cross country season in school history. We were 11th in the Northeast region, which was by far our best placement ever. And to put that in perspective, you know, we we talked about the the great things we've done. You know, in the MAC conference, we were second to Iona College, which is a nationally ranked program. You know, we had three runners who were all MAC. We had three runners in the all rookie team. But the probably the most telling statistic for us this year was at that NCAA regional meet when we finished 11th. Our three all Mac runners did not score for us. One of our runners was lost Insane. due to an injury, Ali Bartolotta, and the other two just had an off day, and we had five other girls step up, and that just shows the depth of our program. And ever since that meet, the exposure we've gotten and just the feedback we've gotten from you know, friends of the program, alums of the program, but recruits, other teams, they're standing up and taking notice. And, you know, as Alex said, we've had a really good indoor season, seven individual qualifiers for ECACs, you know, two relay qualifiers, four girls have already qualified for the USA Junior Outdoor National Championships, by far the most in a single season for either program, men's or women's. But I think one of the coolest things was a couple of weeks ago, we were up at Boston University, which the we in the program carpet. like to call the yeah. magic carpet. We go there to run fast, um, and we always run fast because now it's a, it's a mindset. It's an expectation in this program. You expect to run well when you get to meets. I think that's part of the culture change. But, you know, FlowTrack broadcasts there a lot, and FlowTrack's a, a big supporter of all college cross-country track. Go, hey, if anyone that loves uh, track and field, go visit www.flowtrack.com or org. Is it dot org? Dot org. Flowtrack.org. Dot org. Um, it's, you have to pay to get all their great content, but seriously, it's not a lot. If you like running, you like track, you like seeing some of the sickest workouts of all time. And just great content and coverage. You go on there. If you go into archives, you can find one of Maris's own, Adam Vest, giving one of the most ridiculous interviews of all time. Absolutely. <laughs> he was legendary after he won the IC4A title back. Yes, he was. Um, but we were watching the meet, and they are broadcasting live in our, in our last event of the night, uh, 5K event, our senior, one of our senior co-captains, first race back from injury. She goes out. Runs a school record after having a fractured leg not too long ago. And the girls just crowd around her crying and screaming and cheering. And on the live web broadcast, they shout out to Maris College saying, there goes Maris again, yelling and screaming. They've had a great day because every time we turn around, that's all we see that team doing. So it's just it was just kind of a cool thing. And our kids got to hear that when we went back and rewatched that uh, broadcast. So it's been really a lot of fun. The season's over yet. We have UCAC championships next weekend up in Boston, and the men and women are both going to look, again, for more qualifiers, more school records, and just more memories and just things that we can build off of going into the outdoor season and beyond next year. And one thing I've noticed, and I've been around the program basically right now since I started at Marist College, which was back in 07, uh, I really never left. I stayed up in the area. I went home for like a year back in New Jersey, but I stayed up in the area. And immediately when I got back, I hooked back up with Chuck and Pete, started volunteering. So I have seen all these girls' teams. And one thing that I've noticed is the pressure and the expectation has built and built and built. And before this year, I want to say for the last three years before this, the pressures and the expectations been there, but um, uh, just injuries and untimely performances have really derailed. And, you know, it seems like, not to be disappointed because they were building, but it was just a little bit on the side where you looked at the talent level where the girls just, you know, they weren't performing like they were doing in NCAAs or competing at ECACs as hard as they could. And this year, it just seems like they've turned that page where they are now all confident in everyone's ability around them, not only themselves. Every girl, especially in cross country, trusts that if they're having an off race, there's three of them that's going to jump up and run the time that they think they should. So what do you put, like, how hard was it to work on this culture change of getting all the girls on the same page to where the 10th girl in a varsity meet knows she could be four that day? 
I think the biggest thing was, you know, we met at the end of last year and talked about our goals for this upcoming season and what we wanted to see, you know, as the program grew going forward. And, and again, we, like you said, we talked about a culture change, a mindset, you know, doing the little things. Running track and field is just not about running. There's so many things that go into our sport that people don't even realize. Um, and just the combination of the coaching styles of myself, Pete Clazo, and then our fabulous assistant, Erica Maker, who has been a huge addition to our program. Uh, she replaced just, me technically and has been a significant upgrade. <laughs> No offense to Questa. Yeah, but, no, none taken. She's a but, fantastic uh, she's coach. She's a fantastic coach. But I think it just, you know, we got them to believe in the process and trust the process. But the biggest thing, too, with us is consistency, doing the things repetitive that work over and over again. You know, I took that from one of the best college coaches right now, Chris Fox up in Syracuse, talked about consistency is why his team succeeds. And if you can get your team in a consistent training pattern and they buy into it and they believe it and you repeat it over and over, the success will be there. So I did take that from Coach Fox. Quick shout out to Syracuse. That's my hometown. So they've done tremendous things up there. But Which that's is why the that they have thing. kids like Justin Knight that come out of there that, you know, as a pack, they're a great team. But you see him just out there competing on a national level. And he's going to be someone vying for an Olympic spot at one point because he's just unbelievable. If uh, not right now, he'll be he's there already in 20, there. He'll be there in 2020. Without a doubt. Um, but I think that's the biggest change. When I talk to the girls about it and, you know, we've had the success we have. And, like, even, like, one of our – standouts we were at a race a couple weeks ago and she ran great and she kind of looked at me she's like man I, i've pr'd every week she's like when's the bad one gonna happen i said it's not gonna happen because you're doing the right things and you believe that you belong there you believe that you are this great runner now and again it's, it's a mindset thing so every time we step on the line we expect good things to happen and that resonates and it's infectious because everyone buys in everyone believes it but it helps us in the recruiting process because now we're attracting really good recruits to our program um, and we're really proud of that. And we're so we're going to talk about the here and now a little bit. It's like it's currently it's Friday the twenty third. Tomorrow is the last chance meet. But I do want to touch. I want to give some love to our race walkers because one Absolutely. thing that Maris, we're unique. We don't have really a field program. We have Fallon the jumper. She's amazing. She works her ass off, basically alone for the most part because there's only so many coaches that we have. When I was there, I did my best to try and help her, but we're pretty spread thin in terms of coaching. But you know, she works, but we are unique where we have race walkers. We had uh, Christy first. She kind of broke the mold. Absolutely. And Christy LaCourcy. And now we have two race walkers. Tell us a little bit what they just did. Well, we have two race walkers. We have junior Katie Miali and we have freshman Lauren Harris. Uh, Katie came in again. She started looking at Maris because she saw Christy LaCourcy was competing for us. For those of you who don't know, the race walk, it's a its a unique event. It's not an NCAA event. It's not held at the Division One level. No team trains for it. No team competes with it. It's a USATF It's event. kind of on the outscapes of like a marathon. If a marathoner comes to train with the collegiate program, like we have Luke Shane, who did compete for us. But Luke Shane's a marathoner first, and shout out to Luke. But um, it's an Olympic event, and it's something that if people don't know anything about it, it's a hard event. It's not that easy. People will just think you walk fast. It's not that way at all. No. But what these girls did at the Millrose Games, which is probably one of the biggest indoor track meets in the world, they competed well, and they qualified for the USA Indoor National Championships. And that is a meet that is all professional athletes. My two girls were the only two collegians in the meet, in the race walk. And they went out there, and they competed well, and they represented our program with the highest level of – professionalism and pride that we can see and freshman lauren harris who came in as the national high school record holder finished six in that race only losing to five pros most of which are sponsored and a couple of olympians and katie miali also had a great showing out at usa indoors and now they're shifting gears and they're getting ready to train for the their outdoor season but lauren harris is going to be vying for a spot in the team usa world team that will compete in China in May. So hopefully Lauren does what she needs to do, and we're all confident she will. She'll be competing for the red, white, and blue when they go to China in May. Now, what has that challenge been for you to, you know, kind of learn race walking? Because, you know, we know running. We know how to coach that. But race walking is a different animal. You can't have both feet off the ground at one time. Where runners, you're basically, your feet are barely on the ground. Yeah. With race walking, you can't have both feet off the ground at one time. They'll flag you for that, basically. You know, you can't, there's only so, there's so many ways. And technique is so important because you think running is hard on knees and hips. There's race walking is probably significantly harder. So what is that curve for you been as a coach where, you know, shifting gears from 
distance coach to race walking coach. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it was unique. You know, when, when Christy first joined us, Pete and I had never coached a race walker. Uh, although back in the 80s, race walk was a Division three event, and Marist had some really good male race walkers back in the 80s as we look back in the history of the program. So we started learning yeah. about it, and we researched about it. And it's, like Alex said, it's different than running, but it's not that different in terms of the training. You, know, you still have your hard workouts. You still have your long days. And you still have the different things you have to do in terms of form and technique. But the one thing that we've imparted with our race walkers is if they can become faster runners, that's going to help their walk. And I think that's the one thing all three of them have seen. And obviously, listen, as we said, we're, we're not as – proficient in that event. So I've reached out to Maria McTacoffey, who is our current Olympian, our current U.S. record holder in many events. And I work with her and I talk with her and we get training ideas. And she's been very helpful because she helped coach Lauren Harrison High School. So I think that community is such a small niche. So I've kind of immersed myself in it and I've learned a lot. And obviously, you know, the meets that these girls are going to, I mean, Bottom line is they're competing against the best and the best in the country and at times in the world. And we're putting Marist out there, which is always a great thing. But not only a race walking right now, we talked a little bit about our past successes. Currently, Marist is out there. Marist is, you know, we've had some great athletes we talked about. You know, Michelle Gay has been a definite highlight. She's a champion of the MAC in the 10K, one of the better distance runners. But right now... Chuck is really coaching a complete team from top to bottom. We have uh, in the sprinters... Denisha Craig, Debbie Burke, really holding it down. Debbie having probably the best, one of the best races of her collegiate career at max, solidifying points for us at that MAC meet in the 400. But, you know, you go down the line, especially with, you know, returning veterans, Emily Byrne, Shea Bohan, Mara Shafaud, um, Janelle Silvaletti, Jordan Casey. And then you have the newcomers, where I still consider Ari bought a lot of pretty a newcomer. She's a sophomore. But then you have the freshman, Maria Smith. Haley Collins, like there's just so many names and Gianna Tedeschi, uh, Denise yeah. Grown. I mean, I can keep going on and on. We have so many kids that have been part of qualifiers and school records, and it's just, it's it's so easy just to name so many great athletes that we have, and they all deserve the credit in the world because they work their butts off each and every day. They do everything we ask as coaches, and like people ask me, what's it like right now? You're kind of in this groove. You know, we were at the Vassar track the other day doing a workout and shout out to James McCowan and, and Justin Harris, the coaches at Vassar college. They let us use their facility as much as we need to. And they really help our program. And he comes up to me and he's like, you know, you guys killed in the four by relay. You know, it must be a lot of fun. I said, dude, it's a lot of fun. Every time we go to <laughs> yeah. a meet, you turn around, we're doing something special. I said, when you're in a groove like that, it's a lot of fun. And for those sports fans and those coaches out there, it doesn't matter what sport you're in. When your team is in a groove, and we'll get to a group like the Philadelphia Eagles in a little bit. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to be around. <laughs> it's infectious, and it just makes your job that much easier. So we have last chance coming up. We're looking forward to IC four A's, which is important. Um, we have how many girls do we have in IC four A's right now? So right now we have seven girls who qualify in individual events, and then we have two relays. Um, so we're bringing up a good crew to Boston, and then on the men's side we have. Senior Captain Dietrich Moselle, who qualified in both the 5K and the 3K. We have the men's 4x8 that just qualified at the MAC Championships. And tomorrow, the men's DMR is going to go down to Staten Island Ocean Breeze. They'll get the job done. Absolutely. So we'll have both those relays come up to Boston. You know, our goal going into this season, we've competed this meet every year for quite a few years. But we've always had to take vans there because we've only had a few qualifiers. And going into this season, our mantra, and if you follow us on Twitter, you see it all the time, it's, Hashtag get on the bus. Our goal was to have so many athletes make it to that meet that we couldn't drive vans anymore. We have to take a bus. Well, God damn it, we're taking a bus this year and we're damn proud of it. Absolutely. Definitely not to be overshadowed what Dietrich's doing this year. Dietrich is having one of the all-time best years for a Maris distance runner. And if you know any anyone that knows about the Maris men's side, we kind of had our golden days when I was there. I wasn't a part of it because I was slow as hell. But we had some of the, you know, some of the better guys to ever walk through in Germa, um, Dave, Dave Rauchy. We had Mikey Rolick. We had Justin you know, Harris. Justin Harris. And, and you know, and Dave Rauchy and on the sprint side we have Brian DeMarco who still is the greatest male sprinter we've had come through this program. And, and that's not even close. And, you know, and we even had Colin Fredrickson, who was yep. a very good runner. And John Carabetta came through, who did some things. Chris Vanzetta, 
unbelievably did some things after tearing his leg in half. Hakeem uh, Alex Cunningham. Who everyone, if uh, go follow Hakeem, Lifestyle Hurdles. He's on a quest to not only become a pro athlete, make the Jamaican or American national team in the hurdles, but he also wants to spread running. He wants to spread technique. He's very, you know, I love Hakeem. Hakeem's a little rough around the edges sometimes when it comes to personality, but in terms of knowledge and passion, no one's better than Hakeem. Absolutely. So definitely lifestyle hurdles. Go check them out. But we're back to Marist in terms. So we have a lot of athletes going IC4As. This, right now, not looking too far ahead, but this sets up for outdoor season. Oh, it does set up for outdoor season. What is now, outdoor is our short season, which is weird. A lot of high school athletes, indoor short, outdoor is long. At Marist, indoor is our long season, outdoor is short and sweet. What are the goals right now for outdoor? Well, obviously our goal is outdoor is just to continue the trend, to have each and every girl who competes either set a school record, a personal best, a season best. But we're really looking for, again, more qualifiers. Our goal outdoors is we're looking to get – 10 or more individual qualifiers to the ECAC meet. We already have the 4 by 8 already qualified indoors because they ran so well at the MAC meet. Um, and we already have three other individual qualifiers who already qualified for outdoors indoors because that's how fast they ran. And we have, like we said, the four freshmen who already made the outdoor junior national championships, which will be held in June at the University of Indiana. So we already have a good start, but we just want to keep this momentum rolling. And as Alex said, in college, the outdoor season is much shorter than high school. So this indoor season really is the springboard to outdoor. We start the season off with three really good meets in a row, Raleigh Relays at NC State, then the Colonial Relays at William & Mary, and then at Bucknell, which is a huge meet for us. So we're really looking to kind of take this lightning in a bottle and just expand it and send it out to outdoors and really continue the ball rolling and raise the bar. But we also know it's scary to think that so many of our girls return next year. So whatever this year, no matter how successful we are, this is just the beginning. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, and it, honestly, we could talk for hours about this. And me and Chuck often do when we go to meets. We talk for hours about everything, including sports. But this covers so much ground, just how great it is and how great it is to be a part of. And even though I've been gone this year, I still consider myself a big part of the program, and I love it. But, um, you know, just looking at the future right now, without giving away too much, you can't give away any violations or anything like that because God knows we know about violations right well, now. We'll talk about those a little bit. Um, so recruiting-wise, have you gotten a lot of good feedback from recruits and a lot of positive feedback in terms of – and also – talent level of the feet of the recruits coming are we going to yeah. see some of these freshman girls that are having great years with their feet against the fire right away next year absolutely i mean obviously we've had a lot of interest in recruiting because of the success we had as alex said current recruits who we're still talking to i won't comment on but you know i can comment on the girls who've already signed letters of intent and you know the one girl i will comment on is uh, rebecca walters from fayville manlius high school uh, those of you who don't know a lot about track and cross country, you just have to know this. This girl is a two-time team national champion in cross country. She is one of the best runners in not only New York State, but in the country. She comes in with faster high school cross country times than any of our current girls, any girl in the history of our program. Uh, for those of you guys who are, know about Poughkeepsie area, you know the famed Bowden Park. She ran the fastest time at Bowden Park for any recruit that we've ever brought into the program. So we add her to a mix of 10 really good runners coming back. So, yeah, right away we're going to have someone who's going to be able to come in and contribute right away. And the experience for her running at the NXN, the Nike Cross National Meet, and not only running there but winning it twice, being the number one team in the country, she understands the expectations and what it takes to be great. So as we look forward to what Chuck is building now in a potential MAC champion, IC4E champion team, hopefully national competing stage one day, we're going to go to a team that are champions. A team that, unfortunately for New York fans, especially the Giant fans, Chuck finds uh, you know enjoyment in watching this bunch of hooligans, that call a football team. But the Philadelphia Eagles, we all know they won the Super Bowl, and the man sitting right next to me is one of the biggest Philadelphia Eagle fans I know. Chuck, how does it feel? I am still riding this high, Alex. It's, it was an unbelievable thing to watch them roll through the playoffs, to have that underdog mentality where no one gave them a chance because they the dog lost. Heads. The <laughs> dog heads. Listen, I got my appointment coming up to get my Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl winning tattoo. You getting one. the one that I showed you? We're going to tweak a little bit, okay. but that ink's going on because, <laughs> as people know, Philadelphia fans have been starting for this title. I've been waiting for it 41 years of my life. But it's been unbelievable to watch just the team. And I think watching the Philadelphia Eagles team, 
and I said this to my wife, it was great because their team kind of mirrored our team. You know, it was a bunch of really quality players that came together and they bought in and they didn't care about their individual statistics. They cared more about wins and the team and the ultimate goal of them as a group and not about stats. You know, a lot of people came in saying, oh, Sean Jeffrey, he just wants to catch touchdowns and make money. I was just going to say, the surprises, you know, we have surprises. Nelson Aguilar was a guy who was going to get cut, and he ends up being an all-pro caliber receiver. Yeah, I mean, guys like that, Nelson Aguilar, Corey Clement out of Wisconsin, undrafted, comes in, makes unbelievable Sparkle. plays throughout the, pr- the playoffs. Darren esque You know, and then obviously losing a guy of the quality of Carson Wentz who was – by far the front runner for the MVP. He goes down, and you have a guy like Nick Foles who just steps in, is a professional, and he really helps everybody not only play well, but they raise the level of competition because they knew they believed in each other. They believed in the system that Coach Doug Peterson had instilled with them. They took that underdog mentality. Philadelphia as a city took that underdog mentality, and we wrote it all the way to the Super Bowl title. And to beat the Patriots just made it that much sweeter. You mentioned Wentz. You mentioned Foles. Wentz goes down, he was the MVP, easily. Fulce comes in, has a few shaky games after a great one, but has a playoff run that I think might be the best of any quarterback ever. He competes with Flacco's, because Flacco had the best one ever, I think. He's right there. He's a Super Bowl MVP. Wentz is ready to come back. Foles is under contract. As, a, as an Eagles fan, I probably know your answer, but who the hell do you start? Well, here's the bottom line. I mean, what Nick Foles did in the playoffs – And nobody in that organization is going to undervalue what he did. Like you said, there are only so many guys in the history of the sport that can say they were Super Bowl MVPs. And Nick Foles can say that. There's a reason why they brought him back this summer on a two-year, $11 million deal for a backup quarterback because – he knew the system, and he wanted to win. He was going to retire if he didn't get picked he up. He was about to hang it up, you know, which is too bad because people forget not that long ago he was an all-pro throwing 27 touchdowns to only two interceptions under Chip Kelly. So what they did with him in the playoffs, they went back, they looked at his film, they talked to him, and they found the game plan that worked. And as you said, you come in the fall, you have Carson Wentz, you have Nick Foles. As an Eagles fan, and I've talked to other Eagles fans, actually a fellow Eagles fan is actually Monmouth College, Monmouth University assistant coach Chris Torello, and we were celebrating the win together <laughs> at the MAC meet. And we said, as Eagles fans, you hold on to Foles. Because, again, Wentz, you tear an ECL, the timetable, it is what it is, but it, no you don't rush. have to rush it back. You have a veteran leader who's in place, who knows the system, knows how to win. You have guys that buy into it and believe in him. Why would you let him go for a third round draft? Now, here's a question for you that I present that you know I thought of. Say Foles comes in, plays three games, two and one, three or whatever you guys are playing well. Wentz comes in, he's ready to go. He takes the starting mantle, he plays well. Do you do Foles the favor and trade him before the deadline? As an organization, do you do give him the right to go and play as a starter on a team that needs one? I think you do. You, you talk to the man, you give him the respect he's earned. He just won you a Super Bowl title. He is locked into Philadelphia lore for decades to come. That man will never pay for another check as long as he plays in Philadelphia. He's bigger than Jaws and McNabb now. And those guys were the two guys that yeah. Jaws, McNabb, Cunningham, those were the last few great quarterbacks that had chances. Yeah. And he's passed them all in one playoffs. Absolutely. So I think you talk to Nick Foles and you ask him what he wants. Does he want to stay in the team as a backup and possibly make another run at another long playoff push and a possible Super Bowl repeat? Or does he want to go somewhere else and be a starter? I'll be honest, a guy like Foles, do you really want to go play for a team like the Cleveland Browns? I feel like he's like a Jeff Garcia type of guy where you know he'll – you can plug him into any team and he'll, he'll give you wins. He'll be successful. Jeff Garcia was successful literally everywhere he went. But was he a guy that you were going to go and play four seasons with? No. no. He was a journeyman, but he's probably one of the best journeymen to ever do it. So, you know, and we're talking about, you know, so obviously Wentz is the guy when he comes in. It's very rare that you find what the Patriots do where they reload. The Steelers, they reload. What do the Eagles need to reload? Where are they weak in order to contend? You know, after a championship, everyone kind of gets glossed over the mistakes and the weaknesses of a team. Right now, they have the most dominant backfield because of the power right now. I feel like they're just – like you get worn down by those two running backs back there. Wentz is accurate, but what do they need – to contend again next year and not get complacent. I think the biggest thing the the Eagles need to do, one, they they need to be healthy. Like any professional football team, health is always a critical component. Um, You talked about the Patriots, why they've been successful for so long. Besides cheating. 
a little bit of that involved. <laughs> Couldn't do that this year, but obviously great coaching, consistent. You know, Doug Peterson, hopefully he's our guy. But it all started with Tom Brady. People can talk about Belichick all they want. You don't have Tom Brady. You're not winning those Super Bowls. You know, Carson Wentz will hopefully be our Tom Brady, our next guy for 12 years. It all starts there. It's that consistency, the model that works. I think the Eagles have found it. They've bought in. So, obviously, now their big thing is, you know, making sure they stay healthy. They do have to clear some cap space. They're a little bit over the cap. So, they have some tough decisions to make. The one good thing is off of their Super Bowl roster, they return, I believe, 19 or 20 out of the 22 starters Crazy. are signed and locked up for next year and beyond. So, they're in a really good spot, but they do have some decisions they have to make. You know, what do they do with Torrey Smith? You know, he played well in the playoffs, but throughout the whole season, he was kind of a disappointment. He's a $5 million cap hit. You have a younger version of Matt Collins. He's you kind may- of a two-route guy. He yeah. runs a fly and he runs a skinny post. He's never been a great route runner. He's a big play guy, but if he's not making that big play, he's just kind of filling a roster spot. Yeah, so what do you do with Torrey Smith? Do you free up some cap space? You have a guy like an all-pro tackle and Jason Peters, who obviously had a lost an injury. He was still a vital part of the team coaching those guys up in the offensive line throughout the playoffs. You know, what do you do with a guy like Jason Peters, a guy like Darren Sproles, who's healthy, who probably wants to come back and chase a ring because but he's at Clement the end. does what Sproles does. He's and he younger, does younger and he's younger faster, and he's not as injury prone right now. Right. And you got guys like LeGarrette Blount, who obviously want to stay around. But, again, you have some of these tough decisions. You know, Nigel Bradham, who filled in well when they lost Jordan Hicks early in the season. You know, a guy like Patrick Robinson, who came over and played phenomenal this year. And, unfortunately, he earned a huge raise. But we had a guy like Sidney Jones, who sat out this year, recovering from his injury, who can hopefully step in, fill that role. Rasul Douglas, another young guy. You know, the big thing is they need some of these young guys to take a step if they're going to repeat. That's the bottom line is, you know, and then try to fill out the roster. Listen, bottom line, you look around, and I saw some stuff on social media. Guys want to come to Philly to play because they want a chance to win. There are guys who are willing to take pay cuts to come to Philly because they see what's there and they want to be a part of it. Now, do you go out and make some of those moves? I don't know. I heard Ndamukong Sue would play for free. You can keep him for free in Miami. I don't want to disrupt no, the yeah, Apple No, he can get out of there. It was a good locker room. I have to ask you a question that just really came up in my brain. Doug Peterson played, coached really well. He outcoached the best coach in the game Absolutely. in the Super Bowl. Now, one of the things that makes Doug Peterson Doug Peterson is when fourth down comes, he says, screw it, we're going to go for it. Now, a guy that's also made his career off of doing things like that is Riverboat Ron Rivera over in Carolina. And there's been a few times where they've called for his head because he's made a fourth down call or a really gutsy call and it backfired on him. Philly is not Carolina. Philly is very unforgiving. It's what have you done for me lately? They're not going to give a damn that Doug Peterson brought them a championship. If he makes four or five bonehead calls on fourth down that don't go his way or calls Philly Philly or something like it again, it doesn't work. How? What is Doug Peterson's leash after the Super Bowl championship, especially with the way he likes to gamble? Well, I think after this year, he's definitely bought himself no no minimum of two years. This year, you know, the one thing that always that's how about, hard Philly fans are. He just had two years off of a Super Bowl championship. And, Philly fans don't <laughs> care. Listen, we threw both, we threw snowballs at Santa Claus, but like, you kept around Andy Reid for like ninety years, and he only got you so far. We won a playoff game. And you punched a horse in the face. <laughs> <laughs> a guy eating turds on the street. I mean, Philly fans, I love them. We're the best. We're I'm surprised crazy. Philly is still standing. I'm yeah. not going to lie. Listen, that scene on Broad Street was something you'll never see in another NFL <laughs> city. But the bottom line is, you know, Alex is right. I said, yeah, he's got a two-year two leash. Years. Because here's the thing. If we go out and we're 8-8 eight and eight next year, you're going to have Philly fans on talk radio calling for Doug Peterson's head because we expect it. And we know we have the team right now that's built to win in the future. We have a lot of great young talent. And when you have a guy like Carson Wentz, you have to take advantage of those opportunities. Wentz made a huge step this year in the second year pro. I think he's going to make another step. You know, guys talk about saying that his football acumen, he may be one of the smartest guys in the room in any room because he studies hard. He believes in what he does. He has faith in his ability, but he just sees things like a chess player. He sees two moves ahead. He's making decisions before you even get to that spot. And I think that's why he's going to be one of the greatest quarterbacks ever played this game. That you know that will be great for Philly, awful for me because I'm a Jets fan. And I still haven't seen a damn championship. Listen, you guys can go out and spend thirty million dollars on Kirk Cousins. It might get you some more wins, but uh, I don't. That's, want, that's I, just that's just not going to get it done. I like Cousins. I don't think Cousins is the guy. I'd much rather you know. I personally, I would love to see who Minnesota lets go of and grab their trash out of there. If they go with Case, 
take Teddy, not Bradford. I don't consider Bradford viable. He's a good quarterback, but not for what the Jets need. I would take a flyer on Teddy Bridgewater and a draft pick, let them battle it out, and see what happens. Because if the draft pick falls flat on his face, you have a guy in Teddy Bridgewater who was going to be the heir apparent and considered one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. And if they let go of Case Keenum, there you go. Case Keenum just had a season of uh, any as good as anyone. But I'm done talking about the Eagles and being depressed about the Jets. <laughs> We're going to talk about you know another team that's probably been depressing you this year. It has been. Uh, Syracuse Orange Basketball, perennially known as really good this year, not so great. Um you know, we're going to talk about some scandals, and your boy Jim Beheim, you know, he escaped his. He pretty escaped his pretty unscathed. But um, in terms of what could happen and all the especially going on. But for you with Cuse, I really think they need to make a run in the ACC tournament to have a shot at making the tournament. How do you feel? Listen, as Alex said, I'm a diehard Cuse fan. Growing up in that area, I've been attending games since I was two years old. We've had season tickets forever. Um, so, yeah, Syracuse basketball, besides Maris, that's that's my passion. Um, and Alex is right. It's been a tough year for Syracuse for a variety of reasons. Uh, one thing that really set SU back for a few years was they did have those issues with the NCAA. They lost some scholarships due to some impropriety with grades and whatnot. Jim Beheim lost a bunch of wins that were taken away from him. Which I, I think is stupid. The vacating wins and championships, it's yeah. dumb. They did it. Shut up, NCAA. Yeah, I mean, so Syracuse <laughs> did get hit. We had some postseason ban. But I guess you have to be a blue blood like UNC and do everything wrong and not get any penalties. But I won't get into that. We won't digress. No, Part no. of it's because Jim Beheim just likes to pout and scowl and it doesn't help him. Well, Michael Jordan didn't come from Syracuse, only Mellow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but as, as Alex said, you know, Syracuse has been a tough year. Um, honestly, Syracuse fans aren't as disappointed as people may think. Um, we knew going into this year it was going to be tougher because we you know, lost some guys early to the NBA. And the biggest thing that hurt Syracuse this year was because of the, the reduction in scholarships, they only came into the season with 10 scholarship guys that were going to be available on the roster. Um, they lost one guy over the summer, transferred to Seton Hall because he was homesick. Mm-hmm. And then a grad student who transferred in, played six games, and decided he just didn't want to go to college anymore. So now Syracuse was down to eight guys, and one of their freshmen got hurt, and he's out for the season, Howard Washington. So they were really down to seven guys that Jim Beheim would play. And those of you guys who have followed Syracuse basketball know Jim Beheim. Really, he only likes to play five or six that he trusts because he realizes if you're going to win games, you got to go to your guys. But I think that's the biggest part of it. Honestly, the ACC, it's a stud league, top to bottom. I mean, Syracuse is 10th right now. They just lost to UNC the other night. They had a great opportunity to to pull out a signature win for the resume. So Joe Leonardo would finally give them up and get them off the bubble. <laughs> Joe loves us. We're the bubble team. We are every year. They got three games to go, two against ranked teams. They got one coming up this weekend at Duke. They have BC and they have Clemson. They got to get win two out of three. And then as Alex said, they got to win at least one in the ACC tournament if they want to be squarely in the tournament. But what people know, once you're in, that's all that matters. So what are their chances if they're in it? Is this team, Beheim's a great coach. He's one of the best coaches ever. He can coach up. The way that they play defense is legendary. Um, that's really, he's a defense win championships, guys, and the Syracuse zone is something that is known. Um, if they get in, what are their chances to get past some of these? Uh, you know, and, and honestly, in the NCAA basketball, I really feel like there is no great team. There hasn't been a great team in a few years that's a world beater. So what is Syracuse's chances to make it if they get in the tournament? I think if Syracuse gets in the tournament, their chances to get past the first weekend are actually pretty good, even though people might think I'm crazy. <laughs> because, as Alex said, that 2-3 zone, you can't teach it. You can't simulate it, the length they have in that it's zone, the passion. activity they have. They're right now the number six team in the country in scoring defense. And even though they lost the game to Carolina, Carolina was going in a five-game streak, averaging 95, 96 points a game. They held them to 78, which is more than they should have given up. But, again, that was a Carolina team that was coming in super hot. So because of that zone defense, they're always going to have a chance. And they do have three really good players who, if they're hitting their shots, Tyus Battle of Edison, New Jersey, up-and-coming guard, you know, hopefully he'll stay past this year. He's projected second round. I hope he doesn't make that leap to the NBA. Wait one more year, get some more polish on him. He's really good. Frank Howard took a big step up. So if those guys are hitting shots and they're playing defense and they rebound and and the other guys are just doing their part, they can beat teams, and they've shown that. They almost beat UNC. You know, they played Virginia really close earlier this year. They've had some other games where it could have gone either way. But at the same time, if they're not hitting the shots, it's going to be really hard for them to get by. 
Just thought real quick, how the hell is Melo so bad at defense? When he played in a Jim Beheim defense, why is he so bad? <laughs> well, and, and we talk about that. Everyone debates, you know, the the zone defense and is it good, is it bad? You know, the one thing that the zone does do, if you have someone who's pretty bad at man-to-man defense, it can hide them and it can really accentuate their strengths in defense, playing the zone and moving and just having your arms out. You know, if you look at Bayheim's teams now, they're all long. They're all Tall guard, 6'5", 6'6", at the top of the zone with reaches that are longer than that. That's what he prides himself on, those long zones. It's it's a different zone. It's an active zone. And then when they get down, they can actually pressure you and throw a little man at you and really get you going. And that's how they almost came back against UNC. They sped up the game. They made some turnovers. They just fell a little short in the end. Part of that is his three best players are averaging 38 minutes a game, more minutes than any guy in, in the ACC in almost the country. I don't think Ty, I don't think Tyus Battle sat a second in the last five or ten games. So... I worry about fatigue with this team when you have such a short bench. You know, that could be something that hurts them going forward when they get to tournament time. So uh, take heart, Syracuse fans. You have a chance at getting in. And if you don't, don't feel too bad. You'll get recruits back next year and following. And you guys will build again. And Bayheim will do his magic soon. And hopefully Cuse can get a championship in New York's team because New York doesn't have another damn team that's really that good. Syracuse up near Canada is New York's uh, <laughs> best team. So you know, take heart, Syracuse. Hopefully I want to see him get in. I've always had a soft spot for Cuse, but... Uh, hope they get in, but uh, obviously I have a major Division One collegiate coach sitting right next to me, and there's been a lot going on with college sports, particularly college basketball today. Um, I'm just going to read off some of the schools, Alabama, Clemson, Creighton, Duke, Iowa State, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisville, LSU, Maryland, Michigan State, NC State, UNC, Notre Dame, Seton Hall, USC, Utah, Villanova, Virginia, Washington, Wichita State. Anyone recognizes all those names realizes that those are a lot of the teams that sit on top of the standings a lot of the times for their conferences and nationally for college basketball. And they've all been cited for infractions and wrongdoing. And you couple that with what went on at Penn State with Jerry Sandusky years ago. Larry Nasser recently with Michigan State and that disgusting human being that he is. I really hope I really wish the deputies let that father get him and punch him in the face in that video. And then you have Rick Pitino who how the hell he still has a, any sort of clout in Louisville or anything at all. That that program is legitimately a joke right now. Sorry Kadoc, I know you're a Louisville basketball manager, but it's ridiculous. So all these scandals, everything going on in college, you know, uh, Chuck, how has this affected you as a collegiate head coach in dealing with the athletes, men, women, and any sport that you come across? How has this affected you? How has this affected recruiting? Um, how has it affected me? I mean, obviously, I've become very... You know, frustrated and disheartened with some of the things that have gone on in college athletics. Obviously, as a Division One coach, you know, at a great university like Marist College, it really, it really irritates me that we see these things happening and we see these scandals time and time again. Um, I get very frustrated where the NCAA seems to be very reactionary to all these things. They're not being proactive, and obviously. There are issues that have been going on that, let's be honest, people have known about. The casual sports fan knows about it. And those of us who are in the sport, who are there day to day, and talk to other coaches at mid-major schools like ours who aren't part of that Power 5 conference, we know that, hey, there's a reason why all these kids end up at these schools. And there's a reason why certain schools year after year get these top recruiting classes. And let's just say it's not solely for their academic prowess. So, you know, I get very disheartened. Obviously, you know, going back, as Alex said, Jerry Sandusky, you know, I, that's a tragedy. I mean, as coaches, part of our job, it's not just coaching athletes. We're helping to mold these minds, these young men and women. But we're also responsible for their personal well-being while they're here at college. You know, I take great pride in treating all of my girls like they were my daughters because when they're here for these four years, we spend more time with them than they do with their own parents. You know, so I think it's our it's our right to make sure that we're – really cognizant of their health and well-being, not just their physical prowess, not just their times, how many points they can put up in a game. You know, we have to look at them as a full 
person. It's a student athlete. You know, it's our job to educate them and to help them grow. We're not just focused on results. But I think that gets lost in some of the bigger programs. Results are definitely the only thing that matters. The almighty dollar at some of these schools is all that matters. How much money can they make off the backs of these kids? So a lot of times it gets lost. You know, what really college athletics and amateurism is all about. And obviously is, you know, smaller coaches and smaller institutions we are frustrated because a lot of people see this happening and i'll go to school and, and i'll hear people talking about all these things they all oh, all college coaches and college athletes and they lump us into one group and that's not fair and you know and you look at it it's touched obviously football penn state and there's been plenty of scandals in ncaa football it's really hitting basketball right now it touched gymnastics because larry nasser was at michigan state gymnastics um, and, and, you know, and it really it has actually touched our track community because not too long ago, the Nike Oregon Project has been under a lot of scrutiny for potentially using PEDs, which, God, I hope they don't because there are one shining hope for American distance in, like, competing on a world stage consistently. So, you know, it's, it has touched a lot of sports. Chuck, how long do you feel it might take for this to actually trickle down and come out from the major level? Because now the FBI is starting to get involved in a lot of this stuff. Yeah, so it's like, how long do you think it's going to take for it to trickle down from the major collegiate level to start coming down to these mid-majors where some of these mid-majors who pop up and are fantastic and are consistently good, how long do you think until they start to really delve into, you know, even what we do at Maris, and I know we take, we work our asses off as an athletics program to do everything by the book and as good as we can from every single program that we do, we work our tails off to make sure that there is no red tape or no chance at the NCAAs even coming after us. But just from what you've seen, do you feel like there's going to be a trickle-down effect? I think there will be some trickle-down effect because of everything that's going on. Obviously, whenever the federal government gets involved, and they have investigated for two years now, and that's the thing that people don't realize. They've been gathering this evidence. This isn't just recent. They've been following these agents and following these kids and tracking the money and tracking cell phones and the wiretaps and all this evidence they say they're sitting on, I really feel like the powder keg is about to explode. And as you said, there's going to be a lot of big-name coaches and big-name programs that are going to be hit hard because once they find out that there is evidence against all these kids, whether they're taking money or getting impermissible benefits, those kids are going to be ruled ineligible right away. And how is that going to trickle down to – the rest of this year, I mean, they're talking about possibly some of these kids being put on suspension as early as next week if they have the concrete proof. And then how does the NCAA react to that? I mean, going into March Madness, which is one of the biggest money-making events in all of college sports, if you have a lot of these schools who are impacted because of all of this investigation that's gone on and the wiretaps and things they have, how is this going to affect, you know, college athletics? And then the trickle-down effect, what are going to be the reactionary policies that are put on us now going forward because of all these things. Like I said, there's I Syracuse's like, chance, though. It there is, is Syracuse's yeah. chance. If they could sneak in and all these kids, like, yeah. as unfortunate as it is, you know, I'm making light of it, but it is a really bad situation. And, Chuck, you were going to finish about yeah. the trickle down. I mean, and now, I mean, as Alex said, what happened with, with Larry Nasser is probably the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. Between and, Nasser and Sandusky, they're two disgusting human beings that, you know, it's just – it's something that, you know, even me as a coach, Chuck said he looks at them as, their, but you know, all of his daughters. I looked at all these girls as my little sisters. You know, it's like you don't imagine those things while you're coaching or working with these student athletes. That's just, you know, you take that mindset away. You real Again, you realize that they are complete people. They're not just athletes. They're not just, you know, they, they are everything. There's mindsets. There's mentalities. There's different types of pain, different pain thresholds, different, there's so many things that go into coaching and into working with these athletes on a day-to-day -day basis that what they have done, it's like, it's really shocking because it's something I could never imagine even conceiving in my brain. No, and just the sheer volume, the number of women who are affected, especially at Michigan State. And again, those are only the ones we know of. There could be so many more that never reported it well, because like, it happens everywhere on college campuses. Yeah, and it's like the Michigan – I don't know if you heard the Michigan State president as she was stepping down, which crazy enough that she was a female. And her final line was, I'm, I would continue to do my, what is best for Michigan State. And that's part of the problem. They're looking to do what's best for these major schools where the mindset should be we're looking to do what's best for these athletes. And that's where the bottom line is. Me and Chuck, we, we bleed Marist. We love Marist. But if it comes down to, you know, something really going wrong at the school against one of our athletes, I know for me, I would pick my athlete because 
as long as they're in the right, obviously. But, you know, if it's – that's the place you need to be. We're, like Chuck said, you're with these people, these girls, these men, these women – Every day for minimum three to four hours a day and then some if you're holding meetings. So it's a lot. So it's it's a really tough and sticky situation. But I couldn't imagine ever siding with or trying to defend my school or someone that did something that disgusting. No, I mean it's not something as a coach you ever want to hope you have to deal with because I can't imagine what those girls are going through, their parents, the coaches of those athletes – you know, it's it's really tough for me to fathom that something like this was going on for so long and no one knew about it. And if they did know about it and it wasn't reported or it was covered up, that just makes it even more deplorable. So, you know, our prayers are going out to all those girls who were affected by it. Yes, Hopefully that they, they do the right thing going forward. But at the same time, they can't stay silent forever. I know a lot of people are looking for some of the bigger name coaches to come out and, and comment on the situation because, you know, when you have other athletes in that program – being accused of some of these allegations and nothing's being said. Sometimes silence is the most deafening thing ever. Absolutely. So we, we said our piece about that. I don't want to get into too much about this because, you know, Chuck is a major collegiate coach and I don't want him to say anything that could possibly damn him or get him in any sort of hot water with the NCAA. So we're going to move on to something a little more positive. The New York Yankees, spring training, all the talk has been about you know, the Stanton signing, bringing Stanton and Judge together and with Sanchez and Didi and all of these great things. So first, I want to get your reaction. This They made their one big move. They just made a trade for Juru, which is a great trade. To Unbelievable get trade. Get that is, infield that short People up. have quietly let it go under the radar, but that, that trade for Juru is going to pay off huge dividends for them. Going forward. Absolutely. It gives Andrew Har and Torres a chance to mature while he's playing at a very high level, similar to the Didi move, where Didi was very under the radar, and now look at him. How do you feel about the Stanton move, first and foremost, because that's the big one? Oh, first and foremost, I mean, listen, the, the team was one game away from the World Series last year in a year where, guess what, people didn't expect them to be there. Um, I, mean, I, now, I know I know Joe Girardi, you know, he was let go. He wasn't renewed his contract. And, and I think part of that was just, I think it was his time was up with the Yankees. They wanted a fresh, a fresh face, a fresh voice. He's going to, Aaron Boone is going to love the players, Chuck. He's going to be compassionate. And he's connected differently than Girardi was. Yes. But don't get me wrong. Joe Girardi was a great manager. What he did with that roster last year, there's not many guys in baseball who could have done the same. Girardi made a lot with nothing for a lot of years. They're, after the heyday and went to Shera, A-Rod, they all started to get old. Girardi kept those teams relevant, which was just a miracle the way he worked around those egos as well as the lacking in talent. But going back to that big move, as Alex said, the, the trade for John Carlos Stanton, and, and a lot of people are wringing their hands and saying, there they go, the evil empire is back. <laughs> Let me look at you, baseball fans. They trade for Stanton. You know, they do give up an all-star in Sterling Castro and a couple of lower prospects. But the bottom line is the Yankees weren't looking for that trade. That trade came to them. John Carlo you know, was looking for that trade. He forced Derek Jeter's hand. Hey, Derek Jeter, and, and a lot of people are very critical of Derek Jeter and that ownership group and what they're doing. And I understand, listen, they got to rip it down and start up again. And he talked to a bunch of other teams looking to see who would want to take on John Carlos Stanton. Obviously, he's the reigning National League MVP, and anybody would be lucky to have him. In the I lineup. can't remember the teams, but it was reported he had two other deals in place that Stanton said, hell no, I'm not going there. Make a deal with the Yankees or cut me. Like that was like that's literally what oh, he said. The St. Louis Cardinals thought they had him. Yeah. And if you're Brian Cashman, how do you turn that down? You add a player of that caliber who people again they're wringing their hands at his contract. He's still only 28 years old. He is in the prime of his career. And you stay below the the luxury tax line. I mean, that was the big thing. George's sons, God bless them. They're not their old man. They're not going to open up their checkbook. They're running it like a business. But they do see that hey, now is the time to build and building a winner makes money and with this farm system and the protection and that lineup that he's going to have batting near sanchez judge greg bird Didi gregorius there's constant protection up and down that lineup so it's a lot of people equate this to the a-rod situation because a-rod was 29 when he came over with his mega deal yep and a lot of people are finding similarities in it and there's some major differences and one of them is that lineup that a-rod was on they had power don't get me wrong they had giambi they had they had some good players but at the same time, they didn't have the youth, number one, that this no. group has. And the potential, because all those guys that he came on were guys who basically reached their potential. This group is still reaching their potential. 
And he's going to be protected. If Greg Burke can get a full season, you're getting 30 home runs out of that guy. Absolutely. And, and that's the other thing. And the other thing is going forward from a you know a finance standpoint, this doesn't impede them from making another splash in free agency after 2018, which is what they were kind of gearing up for. Brian Cashman said, if I can make this move, bring in a surefire all-star MVP caliber player and then still have room to go and get a guy like Manny Machado next year who could very well sign with the Yankees because, let's be honest, no one wants to stay in Baltimore. Yeah, but if, you know, if Andujar, he said he'd play third. If Andujar comes out and does anything like what, or Torres does anything like what Sanchez or Judge just did, Machado might become expendable, just like Bryce Harper has now become oh, expendable to yeah. the New York Yankees. Yeah. Everybody who's thinking Bryce Harper's going to sign with the Yankees for $4 million a year, that ship has sailed. You have a great outfield. You have two studs in the corner now because you can put – Judge or Stan in the opposite corner. They Judge still... also can play center. They said they might play Judge at center. People don't realize the freak uh, athlete that, Aaron, that oh, Judge is. Aaron Judge, what he did last year, just the sheer size of him and how he moves in the outfield still blows my mind. That, that leaping catch he made in the playoffs, I mean, oh, my God. I think that the Jets need to go, and, you know, Russell Wilson's coming to spring training. Hey, he's, he's there already. He's there yet, spring, the training, spring training, so he's there. I think the Jets need to bring Aaron Judge in. Sorry, Safarian Jenkins. He needs to be our tight end, and, you know, if he just kind of works out, you know, I know it's hard to turn down the money that the MLB can give, but come on, Judge. Come play for the Jets. But, you know, <laughs> as Alex said before, the one thing that I really love about the moves the Yankees made, you know, and Brian Cashman, he gets – he gets crucified a lot for some of the moves he's made. He's done a phenomenal job over the past two decades. But the one thing as a as a lifelong Yankee fan, when I look at this team, it reminds me so much of that mid-90s team. And, oh, and, yeah. And what they did, they built through the farm system. Listen, right now they have the number one rated farm system in all of baseball. And they made those moves a couple of summers ago to get all those guys, get those young guys. They made some timely trades when they knew they weren't going to be able to contend. You know, you gave up some really good players, but you got back so much. You know, and you just look through, like Alex said, you have every like Drury, 25 years old, Torres, 21, Andohar, 22, Didi's 28, Greg Bird is 25. Your infield is set for the next five to ten years. Then you have Sanchez behind the plate, who's going to be probably the greatest hitting catcher of all time if he keeps it up. And then you have Judge and Stanton in the outfield. You have Aaron Hicks, and you have guys down in the minor leagues like Clint Frazier and so many young arms they have coming up. The Yankees are built now, but they're built for the next ten years. And, you know, we move on. Obviously, they can hit. Uh, but the thing is, we don't want to win every game 10-9. So their starting rotation really overperformed last year. I think that's really what got them where they were. Severino came out and showed that he could be a star. Yeah, that one, that first dud in the playoffs, but then he came out and pitched like a friggin' psycho. Sonny Gray was shaky. Not everyone can pitch in New York, but I think he's going to turn it around. Absolutely. You have Tanaka who came around, he needs to play better. You have CC, but also you have Jordan Montgomery, who's a big, lanky Andy Pettit. That's just really the way I look at him. But then you really turn around and you look. You have Justice Sheffield and Chance Adams sitting there in the farm waiting for their chance. So if one of these guys falter, also you have Luis Sessa, who disappointed but can make spot starts. So the, and not to mention, they're going to stretch out Chad Green again and possibly throw him in the rotation mix with the breakout season he had doing some long relief and the arm talent he has. So I think the Yankees, yeah, bottom line is yes, they can hit for show. We all know that the power they have in that lineup, you're going to go – Judge two, Stanton three, you know, and then you have Sheffield. I mean, Gary Sanchez hitting four. There's no lineup that can match that. Then you have a guy like Greg Bird. You have Didi Gregorius. Up and down the lineup, you have guys who can knock the ball, but they can also run too. But the biggest thing that's going to take the Yankees over the top is how is the starting rotation play out? How strong are they from start to finish? As you said, you got Severino, you got Sonny Gray. You have him under control. Tanaka admitted he wasn't healthy last year. He now it's an injury. Interesting in terms of Tanaka. Brian Cashman was talking, and he said that they're really interested in going to a six-man rotation. Absolutely. Which means that either stretching out Chad Green or really giving Chance Adams, Luis Sessa another chance, or Justice Sheffield, Definitely. who were all super stoked. But that benefits Tanaka because Tanaka was at his best in Japan when it was a six-man rotation once a week pitching. If we can get the Tanaka of Japan – then the Yankees have their ace right there. And I think it might benefit all the guys to get that rest. Absolutely. And then if you get that going, and Aaron Boone, he's an analytics guy, and he's going to he's gonna look at these out-of-the-box things that Joe Girardi wouldn't go to because they weren't on his clipboard. But the bottom <laughs> line is, with this team, you only have to get through inning six because 
The one thing Brian Cashman did is he made them the best bullpen in baseball last year. Hands down, some of these moves he made at the end of the season to get David Robertson, to bring in Tommy Canale, to go along with Batances, go along with Aroldis Chapman. They are, bottom line, the strongest bullpen in the major leagues going into the season. And I didn't think Batances was going to still be on the roster at this point, but it obviously shows that they think they can fix him, and it was mental. If they can fix Dellen Batances then the the sky's the limit because you'll have either him or Robertson setting people up. Kane Lee to come in just whenever they need a guy to throw 130,000 miles an hour and just strike everyone out. And you know what? I think stretching out Chad Green might be a mistake for me because people forget Araldis Chapman had his twilight where he tried his chance as a starter for a little bit and it ended up being miserable and then they're like, I get back in there. But so for me, but yeah, I think the bullpen's amazing. If the starting pitching can hold up, Sky's the limit. What is your opinion right now? Is it World Series or bust for you? Or can you take another year where they get really far in the playoffs, they fall short because they're still young, and they're building towards that World Series? Yeah, I think for the Yankees now going forward, I think, yes, you were one game away from the World Series last year. You add an NL MVP. You add some health in the rotation. You have the strong bullpen. You know, as fans of the sport, it is World Series or bust. Um, I think because we're Yankee fans we're Yankee, every year. We're Yankee fans. But the fact that you got within one game last year and your team on paper, I think, is markedly better. And you bring in a fresh new manager, Aaron Boone, who, again, he's been in baseball his whole life. I don't care about the lack of experience. Aaron Boone is a smart baseball mind. And the AL is weak. If we really look at it, it's the Astros. It's maybe the Angels. The Sox made the move with J.D. Drew, right. which makes them relevant. And, you know, Cashman said in an interview on The Fan, I believe, or Michael We're the K, little engine that could. Little engine that could. And also, the Boston <laughs> Red Sox are the AL East champ, reigning champions, and yeah. we are chasing them. And that is the thing that we can always kind of hang our hat on. You know, people hear that, and they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear We're that the, the Yankees Empire. are the little engine. But the bottom line is the Yankees are back, New York is back, and that's good for baseball. It's great for baseball, but some things that I think are pretty stupid for baseball are a lot of either the rule changes or proposed rule changes. One of them, I don't mind the one that they actually implemented, though limiting the mound visits to six. I, you know, I watch a lot of Yankees games. I love the Yankees. I'm not a big fan of baseball besides that because, bottom line, it's friggin' boring. I can watch the most exciting parts the next day on SportsCenter. I don't need to watch a full game. And, you know, Sanchez is great, but he's a real big culprit of going to the mound almost every pitch. I'm tired of seeing that. I like that rule change. There is also – I've been talking about a potential pitch clock forever. They need to do that because all this is to make the pace of play faster, which is really important. The last rule that they proposed that I heard, which uh, I don't know, the losing team – in the ninth inning, the manager can decide to bat any three players he wants to start that ninth. Out of those three rules, Chuck, which one do you think is the dumbest? Let's see, Alex. <laughs> you know, the, the visits to the mound, I get it. You know, Rob Manfred said he wants to work on pace to play. The pitch clock, shortening the time between innings, I get that. And the one thing about baseball that's always been an issue is the length of the games and keeping those casual fans engaged. But the last rule where a manager can bet <laughs> any three guys he wants in the lineup if their team is losing might possibly be the most asinine rule change in any major sport in the history of my lifetime. I mean, bottom line is, you know, if you're a team that has three stud hitters and you're tied going into the eighth, you're going to give up a run possibly to make sure, hey, I can put up Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stanton, and, <laughs> and Gary Sanchez. Sanchez. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Give me a run. I can hit three out with three swings. The dumbest rule ever because the baseball (laughs) purists are going to argue, what is the point of the game if you're going to rig it in the end? Agreed. So, yeah, I I would agree. I like the limit six mound changes. Uh, Pitch clock's good. Now, one of the things that we've heard is there's a lot of pushback from players. Um, you know, Justin Verlander has been vocal about how stupid it is. There's some catchers coming out and saying that I'm going to do that seventh visit regardless. Well, first off, they might start doing that, but when an umpire sits there and tosses you, you're going to think about it the next time. And the MLB is going to start finding these guys, and there's going to be potential unpaid suspensions that go along with these type of rule violations. And for me, I'm tired of in all sports now. We're going to branch this out. Professional athletes whining about things being too hard. Shut the hell up. 
You're professional athletes. The games are supposed to be hard and you're the best at what you do. You're supposed to adjust. One of the things when I was an athlete, even in like the high school level and the collegiate level, running a friggin' race on the track, it, you know, running is hard. Running an 800 meter sprint is hard with another eight, seven bodies around me, elbowing me and, you know, trying to, if, if it was the professional athlete's way, everyone would just get an 800 meter time trial. And because, you know, it's easier that way. It's not that hard. I am so tired of them saying, you know, it's out of my comfort zone. Grow the hell up. Who cares? You're getting paid to play a game. Especially baseball players. If you're a good player and you're making 200-something million dollars, I can give a damn about how uncomfortable you are. Chuck, are they being big babies? I think they are. I think, you know, <laughs> some of these rule changes... I get it. They don't like change. Baseball players are creatures of habit. You're getting paid a lot of money to play a game. Fans do not want to hear you complain about subtle rule changes. Yes, the S9 rules, like batting any three guys, we get it. It makes no sense. It will never fly. It is the dumbest thing that I have heard. Even Mike Greenberg would say it's dumb, and that's going on a limb because he, <laughs> he puts up some uh, ungodly things in ESPN. But for athletes to complain about, like, oh, I only get to go to the mound six times. Are you kidding me? You're a professional athlete. Prepare for the game. But the worst, the umpire can allow more. It's at the umpire's discretion to allow more. And in extra innings, they get one per inning. Now, and they were saying, oh, it might make sign stealing worse. If I don't know what the catcher is calling, then, then be better at your job. You know, study harder. Maybe work with your catchers a little more and work with every catcher, not just that one guy you really like, and then maybe you guys will be on a better page. If not, good luck. Throw your best pitch and hope that you're both professionals and you're both good at what you do. And just a little sidebar, you know, Alex said, you know, it'll be at the discretion of the umpire to, to see if they allow the seventh visit. We all know in recent years, umpires – seem to like a lot of attention. So I guarantee the umpires are going to have no problem telling the catcher, go back to your position. And let's see what happens with Major League Baseball. When you all have catchers and umpires in notes and those arguments on the field, and then you have managers getting tossed. I just think some of these changes, you got to really look at them. you got to really maybe try it in the minor leagues first. Let's see how it goes for a year. It's hard to implement drastic changes like that. But, I mean, again, People, you know, everyone wants to change. You know, Adam Silver's looking at changes in the NBA with the playoff format. Going to a random one through sixteen seed doesn't matter what conference you're in, doesn't matter what division. I think that. And of great. course, I think it would be great. But you get guys like LeBron. Oh, I don't like that. Of course, you don't like that. You play in the East. <laughs> you know, all you have to do is beat one team. And you're going to the finals. You want to win an NBA championship? Come to the West and try to go through seven or eight. Now, Chuck, just so uh, we'll put it out there, I'll have you back on when it's game six of the World Series. The Yankees are down this year. Sanchez goes for that seventh visit, gets tossed, and then we lose. <laughs> and then we're both sitting there cursing at the screens because that – God damn umpire threw him out over such a stupid rule. <laughs> we're going to go back to this, and I'm going to have you on, and we're going to listen to us both calling them babies when we'll be the ones crying. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I hopefully it won't be a game six because maybe we'll just win it in five. That would be nice. But with that, that was the Sports Opinions Podcast. Chuck, I had a lot of fun. Oh, Alex, thank you for having me on. It was a great time. I could sit and talk sports for hours. And obviously, some of the topics we covered today are great hot-button topics in the current sports world and i look forward to coming back for future visits and you know just to reiterate again chuck is the head coach of women's cross country track and field over at maris college a up and coming program especially in the region and hopefully nationally soon chuck again where can they find you on twitter all right for all of you sports fans you want to follow maris cross country track and field follow us on twitter at maris xctf or on instagram at maris xc Keep checked for next weekend's IC4 and ECAC championships. We're looking to run some fast times. Great performances to cap off our historic season. And shout out to all my girls. Hopefully you listen to some of this. I know your coaches are idiots, but we love you. <laughs> yes, we do. We love you all. And also for sports recaps, anything like that, Pete does a great job. He has a blog on Marist running. Absolutely. So if you want to follow that blog, go to runredfox.blogspot.com. One of the best running blogs out there. Yeah, you'll get all of our splits. You'll get great insight. You'll get awesome photos. Everything you need to know. And it's not just Marist running. Pete talks about everything. He talks about life. And for frame of reference, Pete was a journalist over at the Poughkeepsie Journal, a local paper. The man's one of the best writers I know. He knows how to do it. He makes it sound like a story. 
every single time. You'll love reading his content. But again, Sports Opinions Podcast, episode 12. Thank you all. I'm Alex Cuesta. Find me again on Twitter at AquestaNBN. You can find Sports Opinions on Twitter at SportOpinion30. And again, thanks again, Chuck. This was Sports Opinions Podcast. So long.